This is Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv. Let's take a look today at the Nikon Z50. Who am I? I have been the world's most read source of information on photography, and especially Nikon, since I started my website back in 1999, KenRockwell.com. Ever since then, I've had sometimes around about a million different viewers or more every single month reading my information. And the only person writing all this is just me. But more importantly, I've been shooting Nikon since 1983, and I've been shooting since I was a little kid over 50 years ago. I can easily make great pictures with this little camera. Let's take a look at some pictures first, just to get all the nonsense out of the way. What I love most about this camera is how the pictures look awesome, and these are all pictures straight out of the camera. No editing, simply imported into my video editing software, and here you go. This is a shot of bicycles. I popped up the built-in flash in this case so that I could fill in the shadows, which otherwise would have been a little bit darker. It's a subtle effect, but the fact that there's always a built-in flash with me is awesome. Here's a shot of some pomegranates at the farmer's market. And I should mention, all these shots I made within about a half an hour just walking around the local farmer's market. No fiddling, no fancy outings, no fancy travel or locations, just the local farmer's market. With this, I popped up the flash, which lit up inside the pomegranate and made it look a lot more interesting. Well, not a lot more interesting, but made it look better than if I had just shot it with, say, the Z7 and not had brought a flash along. Here, just poking around. It's easy to take pictures of signs. This shot here, again, I popped up the built-in flash. Why? Because the retroreflective signs we have, the ones that light up at night, light up in the day if you pop up your flash. Then that makes the signs more present and stick out, which is the whole subject of this photograph. This, I'm now, all these pictures that you'll see me panning around, I'm panning down from the top, zoomed in in my video editing software. This is a still photograph that I just snapped in a moment, held vertically in my camera. The key is in the software here, on video, I can zoom in because the camera's resolution is so much more than even the 4K video if you're watching this in true 4K. So all this luscious detail you're seeing is all in the original picture and just in the original still shot. I was not panning around or making movies with the Z50. I was just shooting still photos. Again here, I popped up my flash. Why? To just to give a little bit more light into the dark shadows. And what I really love about how these Z50 pictures look, and these are all straight out of the camera, no editing, no raw, just shot in JPEG, vivid with plus three saturation, is just how the enveloping feeling of light just looks so beautiful on this. And this is not something I get on Fuji, and it's not something I get with the Sony cameras. I can't get images this gorgeous for nature and landscape right out of the Sony or the Fuji cameras. But with this Nikon, this Z50, I'm just overwhelmed with how awesome it looks straight out of the camera. The only other camera that's had this effect on me is the $6,000 Canon 1DX Mark II, which just has a magic about the images that just pop right out. This is a utility building. Does this lens have any distortion? No way, Jose. And by the way, you should always go to my website, KenRockwell.com, for the full review. You'll see links in the description, or just go to KenRockwell.com, where I actually have all the original files for you to download and look at to your heart's content. So if you're wondering, will this look good printed 40 by 60 inches? Yes, these will look great printed 40 by 60 inches. The limitation is your skill as a photographer. It has nothing to do with the camera anymore today. Any of these cameras has more than enough resolution for anything. This is actually a tapestry. This is just something found in a restaurant. ISO 800, didn't pop up the flash. Handheld at one-tenth of a second. The VR on this lens, the 16 to 50 millimeter, which is the standard lens with this camera, is also fantastic. Here's a shot. I just love these colors. Now, of course, I'm shooting into the light, and when you shoot through grass in backlight, it usually gets very, very green. But the key is this camera picks it up like no other camera other than the Nikons do. And I just love it. Here's another shot. Just went to lunch. Just look up. All these colors, this vividness, this beauty is all right in the camera. I don't have to fiddle around or do anything. I just shoot, and I'm ready to sell these images. No questions asked. <laughs> On to the next job. No fiddling required. Here's a shot. Again, wide open at F3.5, handheld at 1 13th of a second at auto ISO 800. It looks just great. Here's some more shots. <laughs> Here's a walkway. What I really like is how the pinpoints of light remain as pinpoints. The 16 to 50 millimeter lens does an awesome job at this, which is something you used to have to pay tens of thousands of dollars for with aspherical lenses and noctilux lenses and, and like uh, whatever a cock made me think, noctilux they call them. 
<laughs> cockamamie as spherical lenses. Mind you, this is also an aspherical lens today. Just manufacturing technology has gotten such that we don't have to pay $10,000 to get a great picture and get our points of light to stay as points when we shoot. Here's a shot. This one is straight out of the camera. No editing, no nothing. I lightened up that last one of the walkway a little bit. But this one, straight out of the camera. ISO 1000, handheld at one sixth of a second. Perfectly sharp. And all my other shots made at one sixth of a second. They're also brilliantly tripod, equivalently sharp. No need for a tripod. And here's the beauty of this. Because the VR system is so good with this lens on this camera, I can shoot at a much lower ISO and get much sharper pictures than somebody else shooting something else. The fact that I can shoot at a sixth of a second means that I can shoot this at only ISO 1000, not 10,000 or 20,000, and get a much sharper, more colorful picture than I could if the VR system didn't work as well. And the lens is up to it too. Wide open at f3.5. This lens looks just flawless. Oh, and here's another shot. Again, I'm panning down. The original shot is the entire vertical, top to bottom. I'm panning around inside my video editing software to give you a closer look at it. It looks just great. Now, I did use the perfectly clear plug-in on this one to lighten some of the shadows the way I wanted it to look. And, oh, yes, does flash work well? Here's my dog. This was yesterday morning. Dog's waking up. I like the colors. And the key is the flash. This was actually my SB24 flash that I used in this case, but the built-in should have done the same job. The flash lit up the dog's face. Without the flash, the dog was in shadow. It would have looked like another awful photograph. In this case, the dog is looking bright and alert. The background is lit up by the backlight through my window. And I'm just impressed at how everything I seem to do with this camera just comes out looking fantastic. Back to the camera. What I like about this much more than the Z6 or Z7 cameras is, first off, not only do the pictures look great, and it has a built-in flash, which helps you make better pictures than I can make the other ones. It takes normal SD memory cards. You see these? You know which way is which, and they pop right in. One minor niggle is that it's a little hard to get to these in the corner like that, but too bad. Most people don't take the cards out a whole lot. The battery is a new battery. It's an ENEL25. Honestly, I've never been able to run this sucker down, so I don't know how long it's going to last. The camera is made in Thailand. It's got a lot of plastic and it's got a lot of metal. The top and bottom covers are, are metal. This for uh, popping up flash is plastic. These are plastic which I prefer to the Z7 and Z6 because they're more comfortable. I also prefer that I can operate this. It doesn't need a lock button so it doesn't need me to use a second hand. I can shoot this entirely with one hand. See all this? Everything is on one hand. I can get all this, play, all the specialized controls, Everything is all here. The only thing on the other side is the monitor control button, which honestly I wish it didn't even have. All that does is make the monitor not work. The fact that I can control everything with one hand, I love. For me, someone who shoots every single day and needs my cameras to just get out of the way and give me the results that I need, I love this because I get great results, one-handed shooting, I can just shoot it, and I've got my images. A nifty feature is a self-portrait mode, wherein you can flip this around 180 degrees, and when you activate the self-portrait mode, we'll reverse this upside down so you can see what you're doing, and also deactivates some of the other controls you wouldn't want to hit by accident, which could lose you your picture. Another thing I love is the built-in flash. What makes the Nikon Z50 the world's best mirrorless APS-C camera? Two things. Number one, the great picture quality I can get straight out of the camera. I can't get anything as good as this for nature landscape pictures where I demand vivid, accurate colors straight out of the camera from Fuji or from Sony because neither Fuji nor Sony lets their cameras go as vivid when I set their picture controls up to the full maximum color saturation. I get the look I want directly from my Nikon. Can't get that from Sony. Can't get that from Fuji. If I want to twiddle around with RAW, maybe I could simulate it, but honestly, I shoot every day. I have to deliver pictures. I don't have the time to play on a computer. If you're playing on a computer, you're not photographing. With this camera, I get what I need straight out of the camera. I get on to the next job. And the other reason it's the world's best is simply because not only the picture's the best, but the ergonomics are the best. Look at this. It's got everything on one side where I can hit it with one thumb and one trigger finger and these two little fingers here for the function buttons. This is exactly what I need. I never need to use a second hand except if I want to hit the monitor control button, which I never do because the monitor control button is just a way to turn off the monitors you need. Okay, if I want to pump up the flash, heaven forbid, I have to use a second hand, but that's okay. 
Those two things alone easily make this the best camera. The more I use it, the more I love it. I love it more than the Z6 or Z7 because it does not have the ergonomic flaws that the Z6 and Z7 have. Z6 and Z7 put their playback button over here that requires a second hand. I hate that. Z6 and Z7 take a dopey kind of memory card. That is a very expensive card that only have one, and I just don't like having to do that. So this so far is the world's best. This has the option of a silent electronic shutter, which you can set in the menus. I don't know if you necessarily always want to do that because you get to that, you go to photo shooting menu, and then it's all the way at the bottom. The problem with this is you can't use flash with this. And honestly, when I use the silent mode, I never know if the camera went off or not. So I use the regular mode, which is also very quiet and subtle and non-disturbing. It allows square and 16 by 9 crops as you shoot. And I set one of my function buttons. Also look at my separate user's guide to read that. It's got a low competitive price. It's, well, the price has always changed, but it's uh, uh, certainly competitive with the other guys that are out there. It has a time exposure mode. This is pretty cool. If you go into manual, manual exposure, and then if you go all the way down in speeds, you see you go past 30 seconds, you get the bulb. When you get the time, when you press the button, it just keeps exposing until you press it again. That is an awesome feature. You don't have to bring a cable release. And here's a trick. Use the self-timer to start it, and then just when you're done, cover it with your hand or a hat, and then press the shutter again, and bingo, you've got a you know 13-minute exposure if you need it, although I haven't tried it out to that length yet. And no need for any purchases of special cable releases. What's bad? The, honestly, the only things bad about this camera are that the U1 and U2 settings, by which I live, I program, and I'll explain this in my how to use it sections, I program U1 for pictures of places and things, which means vivid colors, high saturation, and lots of lots of resolution. U2 I set up for people. I use higher shutter speeds. I use lower resolution and more reasonable saturation for pictures of people. And I can switch between these. The problem with this camera is, unlike the Canons, it only remembers about two-thirds of what you need. One-third of what you might want, things like uh, image review modes and, and so forth, are not recalled with the U1 and U2 settings, so I still have to set those manually. Also, the image area settings. If I want it to always shoot people in square and always shoot landscapes in a rectangular mode, it doesn't remember that. If I set a crop mode like 16 by 9 or square, it's always present regardless of how you set that. Another bad thing is there's always a mystery file, nc underscore flst dot dat in every picture folder. It's a junk file. I don't know what it's there for. It's for Nikon's convenience, not mine. Shouldn't be there. That's a flaw. What's missing? There's not much missing. And honestly, I only notice these things rarely and mentioned it just because there's no longer a marked focus mode switch. Every autofocus Nikon has always had an AFMF switch someplace, even on the lens in some cases. I simply program my FN1 button to do this. Now I press FN1, it comes up in yellow, the rear button chooses the modes, AFA, and uh, I have user guides that will explain all this. Check my links in my description. That and the front dial changes the autofocus mode selections. That works great. Honestly, I prefer this new way to do it over having the button here. The button down here was a vestigial artifact in days of 35 millimeter film and the days that they used to have a screw here that would autofocus the lens and you'd have to push that AF-MF button to get the screw to pop out and all other things. things. That was an artifact. Uh, you'd have to push it in this way on the older cameras, which includes like the D850. When you have to push it this way, honestly, when I'm holding the camera this way, I can't push this button this way unless I use a second hand. This is a much better way to do it. So that's a good thing that it no longer has the old-style autofocus control button. The old-style autofocus control button, you'd rotate it one way. I don't know. It was a, it was not a good thing. And so this is much better. There's no battery percentage indication. What we get today is we have a three-way indicator, but we don't have percentage. This is okay because, honestly, I haven't charged this thing in days and I made hundreds of shots and it's still on full. So I don't even know how many shots I can get with this battery. There is no non-CPU lens data setting. Well, that's okay because none of the Z cameras work properly with manual focus lenses anyway because they don't read the aperture you set on the aperture ring. And this camera has no in-camera stabilization, which is better because in-lens stabilization is a better way to do it with all lenses. But because it doesn't have in-camera stabilization, it doesn't need to know what the focal length of your lens is. And honestly... I have tons of manual focus lenses, and when I use those features on my other cameras, I always forget to set it when I change the lens, and it's always wrong. So the fact that there is no longer a non-CPU lens data mode on this, I don't care. 
There's no automatic brightness control for the rear LCD. Well, only my Canon cameras have that and my iPhones. And so that's unfortunate, but that's too bad. There's no 4x3 ideal format crop. Well, again, too bad. There's no headphone jack, but so what? There's a mic jack, 3.5 millimeter mic jack. There is USB, mic, micro USB, and HDMI. There's no GPS, there's no NFC, and I don't care. This works with Nikon Z mount. Now look how ridiculous this little tiny sensor looks in the midst of this giant lens mount, which is oversized even for full frame, 24 by 36, but that's just the way it is. What it gives rise to is goofy looking lenses. This is a great lens, and it should be only this big around, but it gets to be this fat just because it can <laughs> to fit this giant lens mount. The ideal lenses to use, there's really only two lenses dedicated to this camera now, and they are fantastic. This 16 to 50 lens is great. Look at this. It collapses. It's fantastic. It only weighs four and a half ounces, and it is ultra sharp, as you saw at the beginning. Here's the telephoto lens design for this camera. The 50 to 250 millimeters, it collapses for travel. It's ultra sharp. The vibration reduction of both of these lenses is superb. I can shoot them down at speed so slow I haven't even tested them yet. So I don't see why I would need any other lens. Very few people need anything wider than 16 millimeters on a lens on a camera like this. So in this case, I don't see that as a negative. You can use the longer lenses, the Nikon Z mount lenses, like the 85 1.8 or any of the other Z mount lenses for full frame cameras. They just get bigger. You can also use the FTZ lens adapter, which works great with AFS focus lenses. Doesn't work that well with manual focus lenses and doesn't autofocus with the traditional screw type autofocus lenses. But honestly, I wouldn't futz with that. I would just use this 16 to 50 and love this camera. Use a telephoto lens, and that covers everything I need, to be perfectly honest. Autofocus is fast, it's accurate, it's silent with this lens. There's nothing to worry about there. The one thing I will say is if you're photographing sports and action, mirrorless, unless you're shooting the Sony A9 and some of the other newer Sony cameras, mirrorless isn't up to a DSLR yet. If, if most of what you're shooting is sports and action, say a telephoto lens, your kid's playing soccer, I wouldn't go for mirrorless because it's more of an exercise in frustration compared to getting a DSLR, which has pretty much got this stuff knocked up. If you only use one autofocus sensor, it'll focus in and out very quickly. If you're photographing things that don't move, the autofocus auto area select mode works great and we'll find what you need to focus on and just nail it, and that's fantastic. But when you throw those both things at once, if you wanted to find the sensor and then track the subject as the subject moves around left and right and up and down in your frame, that's where these cameras start to run out of gas. Manual focus is fantastic. Anytime you grab the ring, and this is a core competency of Nikon, which nobody else has. Anytime I grab this manual focus ring, which is the back ring, it magically just takes over and goes into manual focus. In fact, it gives us a little scale here, but I love this. It's better than any other brand of camera. Just grab that ring, and any time you need it to, ah, we finally, after three days of shooting, finally got down to three-quarters or two-thirds here. So that is a core competency of Nikon. Anytime you need manual focus, just grab the manual focus ring. Boom, it's in manual focus and works like it should, even if you're set to autofocus lenses. Auto ISO is fully performing. What if I hit play here? Autofocus is fantastic. Yeah, here's some of the... Sh oh, look at this. Hey, it doesn't even look bad off the rear LCD. Look at that. Look at these things. Ta-dum, ta-dum. Wow, this does look pretty good. Well, you can see what the in-camera LCD looks like, but I don't really care because I look through the viewfinder. Can I do this? Oh! No, I can't. It's not focusing. <laughs> Will it focus? Oh, I'm so bad. There you go. There's live playback. What more have we got here? Oh, turned off. Oh, I am so bad. You know, I love live television. I'm sorry. I've been working in TV since I was in high school. So, and I used to have to take it seriously back then. So the fact that I can fool around, boom, there you go. Looks pretty good, huh? That's the in-camera viewfinder. Auto ISO is great. You can program it as you like, your full range of ISOs, and even more importantly, your full range of auto-controlled ISOs. We go to ISO sensitivity settings. The minimum shutter speed I set to 125th for people. And for things, I go to auto, and with these VR lenses, I set it to slower. So, for instance, if you're at 50 millimeters, it'll go about two stops slower. Maybe shoot at 13th, which still comes out super sharp. Exposure is fantastic with this camera. I don't think I've ever had to use more than plus or minus two-thirds of a stop of exposure compensation, which is excellent. Every camera, except maybe for an iPhone, requires occasional exposure compensation in some conditions. From what I've used with this camera, give or take a third, I'm usually dead on. I love the finder. This is one of the few finders that when I look through it, I get the effect that I am looking at a Velvia transparency on a light table. 
it looks much better in person. But the point is, the shots I've made, and then I'm playing them back through the finder, I love how it looks. The one problem is, and this has been a, a core incompetency of Nikon for some time. I don't know if you can see it here. But there is sometimes blue banding in the skies on playback, just on playback. And that's caused by the fact that this playback is usually from a small reference image encoded into each of the image files. And then when it's played back, it will do that. But as soon as you zoom in, that blue banding goes away. And it's not in your picture, so don't worry about it. High ISOs look fantastic. State of the art in APS-C. I'm going to go through these images here. And you can see that as we go up in ISO... The images look the same. At normal sizes, i.e. on your fit your screen here, you'll notice as I get up to even to the crazy ISOs, it looks good. Only when we get to the above 51,000 does it start to look a little screwy. And again, the level of quality you'd like versus the ISO speed is your choice. That's why they have these adjustments. I always point out to people, I would much rather have a picture that's sharp and in focus, but grainy, than a smooth picture that's just blurry. Here are very, very enlarged crops. These are very enlarged crops. This is equivalent, well, you see this the little clock in the corner. Depending on your screen, these are 600 pixel wide crops, which is about a 10 times magnification. So imagine the screen that you're watching this on, blow that up 10 times, and that's about what you'd get. For lens corrections, the Z50 can correct for any or all of distortion, diffraction, and fall off, and all three of those you may turn on or off, although for some lenses like the 16 to 50, they won't let you turn off distortion control. The Nikon digital cameras since about 2007 have always corrected for lateral color fringes. You can't turn that off. That's part of their secret sauce that always works. The mechanical quality of the Z50 is just great. It's got metal where it needs it and plastic where it helps it save weight. What are metal are the strap lugs, of course, the top cover, the bottom cover, the flash shoe, the lens mount, the rear LCD hinges, which are, these are all metal, and the tripod socket. Everything else is plastic. The car door, the car door pops off, so you can put a grip or something on there, I believe. The LCD frame is plastic. The sides of the camera, the front and the back, so to speak, all the buttons are plastic, like most every other camera. And also the flash hump is plastic. The menu system is the same as you are used to in your DSLR. There's less in it than the Z6 and Z7 because there are less features. Some of the features that it doesn't have simply won't appear, like non-CPU lens data. For weather sealing, people get scared because camera makers figured out a new way to differentiate and get more money from you <laughs> for more expensive cameras saying, oh, weather sealing. If you don't buy weather sealed, oh my gosh, your camera will explode and catch fire and set the whole world on fire if you haven't forbid step outside in any kind of inclement weather. No. Here's a shot. My daughter ran out in the rain when it was raining like crazy. I ran out with my camera. The camera got wet. I got wet. You know, it's just fine. We didn't used to have weather sealed cameras back when I started to shoot. We simply ran outside and did our best to put them under our hand or use an umbrella. Here's a rule of thumb. You know, I'm not crazy. I've been shooting forever, and I shoot every day. But if it's really awful out, I'm not going to stick around all day outside. I'm beyond that. So if you live in a place like Southeast Asia where it can rain like crazy or, you know, Kauai, and you'll be out in the rain all day, by all means, get a weather seal camera. For normal use, where you occasionally run out in the rain, you don't need one that claims to be weather sealed. Just do your best to keep too much rain off of it. And if you get a bunch of rain on it, it's not going to die. And if it does, oh well. I think it most came to light when a friend of mine, at least, he's a professional working in Southeast Asia, one day a torrential rain hits and he's running around in the street photographing people and he's having a blast. He probably was out there for half an hour getting splashed, getting the reactions on people's faces. It was just awesome. The problem was the people who were with him who had uh, lesser cameras, some of those guys had problems. But the point is, my friend is nuts. If you're not going to be running around continuously in pouring, drenching rain, I would not worry about the weather ceiling. The touch screen works really well. If I want to set menus here... Let's see, does it work for this? It even works, woohoo, fun. It works great. If I want to enter text, like my copyright information, it's great for entering text. The only complaint I have about the touchscreen is it has relegated some buttons that I like, which used to be down here, the plus and minus buttons to change the levels of magnification, and the display mode button that goes to all the different kinds of displays you can get, are now here. This is great for playback. And mind you, for playback, 
What do we get? Turn my camera on. Whoop. For playback, oh, works so well. You can zip around, see what you want to see. It's marvelous. However, for shooting, when my eye is to the finder, I can't feel where these are. I can sort of get it, and I guess I've only had this camera for a few days now. All the sample pictures at the beginning were shot in just a day or two. It's hard to find these by feel because they're just flat. That's one of the few misgivings I have about this camera. But at its reasonable price and the way the pictures look, I am not complaining. Playback in general is the same as every other Nikon camera. You're familiar with the options, and it does have that blue banding problem, as I said, but the blue banding goes away as soon as you zoom in. Let's see if I can, let's see if I can show that live on TV here. What have I got to lose? Nothing. Okay, here we've got some pictures. How close can I get? Ah, uh, love today. Back when I started in television, look at this. Is this camera awesome? Look at this. This is right off the back of the camera, pointing another camera at it. I love it. Do these pictures look decent? Yes, I'm amazed at how good these look. Ah, you see how there's some banding in the sky? All Nikon DSLRs do that today. However, if you zoom in, the banding goes away. Why is that simple? As I said, there's a file at a lower resolution and lower, <laughs> I should say, higher level of compression that is saved. And when you're just doing straight, oh, we can do that, okay. But you're just going from picture to picture, full the full image like this. It reads an abbreviated version of the file, but as soon as you zoom in, it then reads the entire file's data from the card to give you all this exquisite detail. And again, this is a marvelous camera. So don't let that banding fool you. It's just something that helps the camera actually get quicker from frame to frame to frame by not having to read as much data. Compared. If I compare this to Nikon Z7 and Z6, again, I've got the full information on my website at KenRockwell.com. I prefer this to the Z7 and Z6. Z7 and Z6 have a larger format, so what? The pictures look the same? I mean, literally, they're indistinguishable. Unless you're shooting at, like, ISO 100,000, where there'll be somewhat of a difference, don't worry about it. And guess what? If you're shooting at 100,000 ISO, something's wrong. I can shoot handheld under full moonlight with an f1.4 lens at an eighth of a second at ISO 6400. So the 100,000 five-digit ISOs are purely for marketing purposes. You wouldn't ever actually want to shoot them there because it gives crummy pictures. As I mentioned, I prefer the cards that it takes, the normal SD cards. I prefer the ergonomics way over the Z7 or Z6. If we compare this to a DX DSLR, like a D5600, which is about the same thing with the flipping screen and so forth, the 5600 costs less and takes exactly the same pictures, although it doesn't go quite to the same ridiculous high ISO settings as well. However, if I shot nothing but sports and action, say my kids playing sports with a telephoto lens, I go for the D5600. For everything else, I go for the Z50. Because I love this viewfinder. The fact that I can see my playback zoomed in in the viewfinder in broad daylight, which I can't see on the rear LCD because it's not bright enough and it's not big enough in full sunlight, I'd say by all means. Also, the vibration reduction, this fantastic little lens, I'd say skip the DSLR for anything other than sports and action. Versus a D3500, honestly, that's a great camera. The Christmas specials now are selling that camera with two lenses for like $400. Dollar for dollar, it's going to take the same pictures, although not quite go to the same ridiculous high ISOs. But it's going to be a little clumsier. It doesn't have a flippy screen, which honestly, I don't use a flippy screen. It doesn't have a touch screen. Honestly, I don't use a touch screen. It takes the same pictures. So if money matters, sure, if money matters, get the D3500 versus the Canon EOS RP. Honestly, I love the EOS RP. It's full frame. It doesn't cost much more than this camera. The biggest differences will be when you shoot full frame, Honestly, talk to the guys who actually shoot for a living. The biggest difference is less depth of field and not even that much less depth of field. It gets less depth of field because you have to use a longer lens to get the same angle of view on any given shot. Longer lenses have significantly less depth of field. You'll shoot a 50 millimeter lens on an EOS RP to get what this camera does set at 35 millimeters. So it's just depth of field. If you want a large amount of depth of field, this camera gives you more depth of field under similar operating conditions than any full frame camera does. So the real question is EOS RP or Z50? Honestly, if, if you're a Canon or a Nikon guy, that would define that for you. But the other big difference is this is going to be smaller because it's a smaller format. The lenses are smaller. The cameras are very similar size. The weight is almost identical with the EOS RP only weighing, I don't think, even an ounce more. However, when you add the lenses that you have to carry around with it, for instance, instead of this tiny little retractable lens, I love the EOS RP's 24 to 105 millimeter f4L lens. 
It's much more lens. It probably weighs more than this entire camera does. That's really it. It's a matter of size and weight and brand loyalty. Canon is a fantastic brand that cares more about us than Nikon does. You can call 800 OK Canon, you get the support you need. Nikon customer support is usually uh, indifferent. But that is a very good thing to look at. And if you just want a compact camera for taking on vacation, getting everything you need with this and this lens, honestly, I could go away pretty much for the rest of my life and get every shot I ever needed to get with just this camera and these two lenses. You don't even need a bag. You put the extra lens in your pocket, swap them out, swap it in your pocket. You are good to go. The Canon system would require more to carry, or the results would be fantastic. Would they be any different? Honestly, you'll never see a difference in any normal use. Resolution-wise, the RP has a little more resolution, but you will never see that. Versus the APS-C Canon EOS M series. Honestly, I don't know. I have not tried the EOS M series for the past couple of years. They're probably really, really good because Canon makes really good stuff. The first EOS M cameras are awful because although the pictures looked fantastic, the original EOS M took forever to respond to button pushes. It was like a point and shoot. It basically worked on the power shot frame. Today, I think the EOS Ms are probably something worth looking at, but I haven't looked at them recently because, well... I just haven't. There's only so much I can do in the course of a day. Check my user's guide. Check the links for my user's guide. My user's guide is already up in full glory to show you all the pro secrets of how to get great pictures with this camera easily. To sum up, I love my Z50. I had no idea it would be so much fun to shoot and give me such incredibly great looking images with essentially zero effort. Point and shoot, just so much simpler. And what comes out of the camera, directly out of the camera, looks fantastic. That alone means buy this camera. I love this camera. It's also relatively inexpensive. The ergonomics are fantastic, and the pictures look great. And that's what I've been saying throughout this whole review. If you think you want one, please get it. You will love it. If you have any questions, gosh, email me. Read the description. Look for the links to where to get this, the links to my website. And I hope you've enjoyed this review of the Nikon Z50. Thanks again for watching Ken Rockwell, kenrockwell.com, and kenrockwell.tv.